Dave McMenamin is uh, the ESPN reporter covering the Lakers. He was there with Game 1 last night in Golden State and joins us on the program. What did you expect last night, Dave? Well, the Lakers coming into it had won 14 out of 18. They've been playing really good ball in high leverage situations. They needed all those wins towards the end of the regular season to secure a spot in the play-in tournament. They beat Memphis. Their confidence was spiked. They got the weekend off. So I expected a strong performance. I don't know if I expected them to be up 14 in the fourth quarter and kind of controlling the action for most of the night. But they're a group that believes that they can win this thing. Uh, That was the sense I had coming into it. And certainly they were going up to San Francisco with the intention to at least get a split. The philosophy, the offensive philosophy, Golden State took over 53s. The Lakers seemed like they were content, aside from LeBron, to have two-point attempts here and get to the free throw line. Does that philosophy change for either team going into game two? I think the Lakers want to keep the same diet. I mean, they have recognized that they go generally as Anthony Davis goes. LeBron James is going to manage the game, however he deems fit on a night-to-night basis based on however the defense is playing. But if Anthony Davis, it's one of those old maxims, you feed the big man, and then it gets him more activated on, on the defensive end. He came off a series against Memphis where he had 26 blocks in a six-game series. He had four blocks in game one, and – Part of that was going nine for 10 from the field in the first half, just activating him. As for the Warriors, obviously they were the highest paced team in in the first round of the playoffs. You're comfortable with Klay Thompson and Steph Curry taking just about any look they could possibly get when they step on a basketball court. I don't know if I'm Steve Kerr. Perhaps I, I, I talked to Jordan Poole a little bit about some of the shots that he took, but overall, I think both teams are content with that style. I mean, you think about it, it's a tied game with, Two minutes to go. Okay, but if I paused the Jordan Poole shot as he releases it, would you have said good or bad decision? Oh, bad. I'm like Steph Curry, who's leaning over in disbelief after the shot. Tarim's off to the left. Now, I have seen Tyrese Halliburton, a a bright young star in today's game. He defended the shot. He said, what do you want? It's less than 10 seconds to go. It's wide open. You want him to put it on the floor? and lose his you know vision and and the separation there yeah you're right separation but you still have 10 seconds that's sometimes an eternity in a game and considering how good that group is in relocating uh shooters you know, look at the shot that steph curry hit to tie it that was him zipping all around the court and eventually getting open just beyond the line on the right wing I think you could find a better shot. Yeah, and I I commended the Lakers for doing what I'm always telling teams to do. Don't let the best guy on the floor beat you. They double-teamed Steph, and therefore Jordan Jordan Poole was so open. I don't know if he realized there was 10 seconds left. I don't know if he realized exactly where he was on the floor, but Steve Kerr said all the right things after. Like, all right, you know, we're good with that. You know, I'm fine. Like, he has to back up his guy, but it, it wasn't even a close shot. That that's what was alarming. If you just said, "Oh man, in and out," or almost went, it, it wasn't close whatsoever. And that's that difference of twenty six feet to thirty feet. And not a lot of guys can do that with a game on the line, with the confidence to go. I got my shot. I mean, yeah, we watched the finals last year where he hit several shots even beyond that mark against Boston. And so I guess you could say he's done it before, but every situation can generally find a, a better shot, especially considering his teammates. Like you have Clay Thompson, you have Stephen Curry. I, I think if you're going to take that shot, you better make it. If you were going to bet on Anthony Davis's performance in game two, really good or really average? There has to be a regression to the mean based on what we saw in the first round. Now it doesn't say- have to be Dave. Well, I mean, to start nine for 10. Well, they have nobody to guard him. rebounds in the first half. That is true. I mean, Kevon Looney, we should put some respect on his name, Dan. No, he's good at rebounding when others miss. He's just not good <laughs> at maybe stopping Anthony Davis. Therefore, there there's no rebounds. <laughs> to me, it was Anthony Davis getting the shots to fall in the 12 to 14 foot range. Yeah. Uh, his jump shot has eluded him for the last several years, and 
that was a sign to me. And again, it had a carryover at the free throw line, which is basically the same type of shot that if he's going to hit that, they're not going to be able to do anything with him. Uh, but just the Memphis series, it was a spike of a, a really good game comes down to earth offensively, but still maintaining that defensive presence. I think the Lakers will take it uh, because if that happens, you look at the first round, six games, five different leading scores for the Lakers. So maybe you don't get a nine for 24 game out of LeBron and he can carry you with the 30 plus night. Dave McMenamin is uh, covering the Lakers and the Warriors, ESPN NBA reporter. We were talking about this is not a rivalry between these two franchises, but it's more of a, a legacy rivalry with Steph and LeBron. Like if one wins another championship, like moving up the, the legacy list there, uh, a, a title would be more important to who, in your opinion, between those two? If Steph gets a fifth ring on LeBron's watch, there will be a lot of people out there that that will have him leapfrog LeBron. Really? Uh, oh, of course. I mean, we saw some people last summer that was already putting him in the top five. Okay. With that fourth ring. And I think there will be a chorus of that sentiment crescendoing, whereas LeBron's place, I think, is kind of secure – so long as he keeps him away from him, keeps keeps it at a tie, uh, or certainly, obviously, if LeBron gets a fifth ring, um, LeBron is pretty much top of mind, a top five player. Steph would get there, I believe, uh, with the additional ring. It's just there is a recency bias to all yes. this. Yes, yeah, because LeBron has done it for twenty years. Steph has done it for ten years, for yeah, you know, thirteen or something like that at this point. <laughs> well, he had a couple. A nine-time All-Star, is that right? Yeah, LeBron's Probably. a twenty-time All-Star. Yeah, right. Nineteen. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I don't know. If there's any rationality, like when it comes to this conversation, it's an emotional one for uh, a lot of fans. But I, I think to me, that if you zoom out a little bit, this is the two ambassadors of the NBA changing beneath their feet. LeBron James is the ultimate positionless player of this era. Steph Curry is the face of the three-point revolution. Both of those tenets of the strategy are, are what now carries the day in the league. You okay with Embiid winning MVP? I'm okay with it. I voted for him last year. I voted for Giannis this year. I'm okay with it. I, I don't know. It's a little bit of a, you know, a, so many times the bride made you're finally uh, the bride because you, you did come in second two years in a row. But uh, you just hope that he's, as you mentioned at the top of the segment, you hope he's on the court against the Celtics and, and can look like the MVP in the biggest moment of the season. Yeah, I think I think Giannis is the best player in the game. Uh, but I and having voted on the MVP, it is weird, though, that we feel like, oh, it's like the Academy Awards. You know, it's that director's time, or Scorsese deserves it for that movie, and you're like, is that the way we should vote? That it's Embiid's time. Oh, was it? He missed a lot of games. Uh, Bucks had a better record. Yeah, I know. I, mean, I know. To me, it was best player and best team is kind of the thing that like what I generally go to. That's the, that's where I begin with, and then if someone like totally. Uh, shoots that argument out of the water, then of course uh, I'll evaluate their case. But yeah, I, I thought last year it was more impressive for him dealing with the Ben Simmons saga and, and not letting that team yeah. fall from their expected level. But uh, it, it felt like there was a seismic shift when uh, Perkins mentioned about the voting and the makeup of the voters because, you know, DraftKings said the Joker was a prohibitive favorite to win. And it's almost like the voters, because there wasn't much time left in the regular season, I don't think. And it just felt like maybe people did a reset on that. And I thought that that changed the voting, whether it changed it for Embiid winning. But it felt at the time, Joker was the prohibitive favorite to win the MVP. What kind of impact do you think that had, if any, in your opinion? I, I, like Andrew Perkins is someone who I love working with, and, and I hope people listen to what he has to say. Uh, maybe not all the time, <laughs> but but a lot of the time, uh, I think he is kind of has his pulse uh, or finger on the pulse uh, of the things that matter in the sport. And 
you know, there was a time in the season when Jason Tatum seemed like the guy was going to get it. And, you know, even prior to that, the, Luca, there was a conversation around it. it, it it's a strange thing. Uh, you have to have the requisite moments when people are kind of locking in their vote. And we live in the 24 seven news cycle where people kind of get bored of your case, they, even through an 82 game season. So it, it's kind of having the moments at the right time when people's minds are malleable to come off the uh, kind of the initial front running narrative. Now, I think that's a part of it that is affecting the ultimate outcome. The votes are public now. And if there is someone that, that it seems like the pack mentality is going with, do you want to be the one guy to step away from that? You know, Mike Brown, first unanimous coach of the year pick in NBA voting history. I don't, I mean, I, I voted for him as well. And I think he's well deserving, but I think a diversity of opinion is, is sometimes a good thing. And the fact that all these awards are put, put out there and people are concerned in some level of their mind about social media backlash. Yeah. Doesn't help serve finding the, the, the most deserving players. Yeah. You know, and I liken it to Patrick Mahomes. Giannis is in the Patrick Mahomes category. We take him for granted. You know, he won an MVP. He won a title. And, and that's an ultimate compliment because Mahomes is what? 26 years of age, maybe 27. And we're like, we forget how great he is. And, and I think we did this with Jordan to a certain degree. Certain players, they graduate, and then we go, oh, that's right. And, and therefore, we root almost for the new story to come up, you know, that we can talk about this guy. Uh, where, you know, the media feels like they've been desperate for Luka to be an MVP. And I keep saying he's not going to be an MVP for a long time because the team is not good. And, it, you know, if he has the number one seed, then he can win an MVP. But... You know, he hasn't graduated there, but it feels like there's some of these guys who get there. You know, when Jordan didn't win twice with Barkley and Carl Malone, it was like people it felt like the media was desperate. Like, give us another thing to write about. Even though they were worthy, Jordan was still the MVP of the league. And to this day, Dan, LeBron has four of them. And within the last month, I was in the locker room post game with him in Los Angeles, and we're having a conversation about something. And that's something gnawing at the back of his yeah. mind. And he brings it up. Well, I'm still in the four MVPs. <laughs> What's going on? And here's a crazy He hasn't stat. won one in 10 years, Dave. And this was the first year of his career. And now he was not on my MVP ballot. He missed too much time. The Lakers were under 500 for a lot of the season. First time in his 20-year career, he didn't get one vote for MVP. I, that's a wild stat. For 19 straight years, yeah. people who whose opinions, quote-unquote, mattered – viewed him as the best player in the game. Will you ask him about that? I, most likely, yeah. Last night, probably not, you know, in the podium situation. Yeah. He's sitting next to Anthony Davis. But, yeah, if there's a shoot around or a practice, I think that would be an interesting conversation. Hey, thanks for getting up with us. We appreciate it. Uh, thanks for joining us, Dave. You got it, Dan. Uh, Dave McMenamin covering the Lakers-Warriors series, ESPN NBA reporter.